Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. If you got your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis. We are going to continue the series that Mark started last week, Lessons from Israel, and we are awfully excited about that. And we are looking forward to spending several months probably in the story of Israel. But we'll say more about that in just a minute. We started last week in the narrative of the Old Testament, the story of the Old Testament. And so as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you this week, there was a figure that came to my mind. Now, he predates Israel itself, but I thought that it would be appropriate for us to spend some time thinking about this man. So let me ask you first, before we jump into the story of Abraham, who is your hero? Of all the heroes growing up that I had, whether it was Ken Griffey Jr., the baseball player, Wade Boggs, Derek Jeter, liked all those guys growing up, football players like Danny Warfel, basketball players like David Robinson, action heroes like John Rambo or Arnold Schwarzenegger, heroes always played a big part in my life. Now, ladies, you may not understand this, but if you talk to your husband and he's honest with you, when he talks about Superman or Spider-Man or Batman, those weren't just figments of his imagination when he was a kid. Those are options, real options. He thought that he could be Superman. He thought that he could be Spider-Man. He thought that he could be an action hero. John Ortberg says that every man was created to fight injustice and rescue beauty. And so heroes play a big part in the life, especially of men, because we want to be heroes. The Greeks had a saying that you could tell a lot about a civilization based on the heroes they had. What heroes do we have in America? And I think that if you look at those heroes, that corresponds and will tell you a lot about who we are as a people. Who are your heroes? Who are your heroes? The nation of Israel had its own heroes, its own set of heroes. In fact, in the New Testament, we find that many of those heroes are listed in the book of Hebrews itself. But of all the heroes that the nation of Israel had, there's one that has more square footage, that takes up more space, and it was the original patriarch, Abraham. As a matter of fact, the author of Genesis gives him, Abraham, the story of Abraham, 12 whole chapters. From chapter 22 on, and I want to look just as an overview of what the story of Abraham says, and I want to make one big point with you this morning. In Genesis chapter 12, which is where the story of Abraham starts, after the fall of Adam and Eve, after they fall out of relationship with the Lord, after the destruction of the flood, after the destruction of the Tower of Babel, there's a lot of destruction in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. We find the story. After all of that, God sets this man, Abram, aside, and he says, Abram, leave your country. Leave your people, leave your father's house to a land that I will show you. If you do this, I will make your name great. You will be a great nation and everyone on the earth will be blessed because of you. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Ultimately, God comes to Abram and he says, if you do what I say, if you trust me, then the entire world will be blessed because of you. Can you imagine what it would be like to receive a promise like that? If you do what I ask you to do, if you leave your country, if you leave your father's house, if you leave everything that you've ever known, everybody on the planet will be blessed through you. Can you imagine what that would be like to receive a promise like that. What would that have felt like? Now, here's the deal. Abram obeys. He listens and he does. He leaves his hometown. 
And Abraham comes from a place that has an unfortunate name, Ur. I thought a lot about that name this week. But Ur, despite its weird name, is a cosmopolitan urban center for its time. Think New York, think London, think Paris. Abraham has a good job in one of the biggest cities in the world. Great salary that afforded his wife, Sarah, the opportunity to do all the shopping that she wanted to. They had everything. They had everything. And yet, here comes God who says, Abraham, I want you to leave everything. Ur was home. That's the important thing. Now, how many of you were born and raised in the Upper Cumberland? The vast majority, right? A lot of us. You can appreciate this, maybe more than most. God asked Abram to leave Livingston or Rickman or Cookville and move to Montana. Would you do that? When all you've ever known is the Upper Cumberland? If God comes to you and says, I want you to plant a church in the poor region of Washington State, what would you say? And imagine, now keep in mind, it's not just the call. This is home for Abraham. And just off his master suite, there's a room that's set aside for a nursery. They've been waiting. They've been waiting on a baby. Like a lot of young couples, they had a dream of starting a family. They picked the colors. They picked the furniture. But the baby never came. They wanted to stay in Ur, no doubt, because that's where family was. And it's easier to raise your child when family's around. It's a nice town. But God had other plans. They waited for a baby for weeks, for months, for years, for decades. And the baby never came. No telling how many times Sarah took a pregnancy test and those lines never matched up. But God appeared. And God said, Abram, I want you to leave it. And if you leave it, if you trust me, you will bless the world. Abraham, based on what you know about me, am I trustworthy? Church, is God trustworthy? And God says, Abraham, if you trust me, if you find that I'm trustworthy, if you can, I have a promise for your life that you couldn't even come up with on your own. And with that, Abraham puts in his two-week notice. He puts his house on the market. He hooks up the U-Haul to his truck. And he's off. And rapid fire, check it out. They end up in Egypt because a famine hits. A famine hits. Can you imagine that? God makes Abraham a promise and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless the world through you. Abraham listens and then there's no food. So they find themselves in Egypt in front of the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh. And Abraham, trying to take matters into his own hands because he doesn't see how all this is working together, tells Pharaoh that Sarah, who is his wife, is actually his sister. Happens all the time, doesn't it? But God made a promise. So God intervenes. In chapter 13, Abraham's own nephew, Lot, tries to sneak in on the deal and co-opt the promise that God has made to Abraham. And Abraham almost falls for it, but God made a promise. And so he intervened. And again, the threat is neutralized. Church, when God makes a promise, it will be done. Regardless of what it looks like today, regardless of how you feel today, regardless of what the truth you think is saying about your circumstance, when God makes a promise, it will be done. In chapter 15, Abraham sits down with all of his accountants, all of his lawyers, to draft a will. And he decides that everything he has should be given to his servant, Eliezer. Because he's waiting on this promise to be fulfilled. But there's no kids coming. God says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have a baby. And everybody will be blessed because of you and your son. But it's not happening. And so Abraham says, I guess I'm going to have to give all of my stuff to my servant. But God intervenes. 
in chapter 16. Abraham's hanging out in his tent when his wife shows up and says, Abraham, God's not going to keep his promise, so let's try to have a baby with my servant. And for 13 years, Abraham believes that that child, Ishmael, is the promised one of God. But God shows back up and says, no, 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 no. I made you a promise. You can take that promise to the bank. It may not be happening on your timetable. It may not be happening the way that you want it to happen. You may be worried about when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And the story says that when the angel of the Lord appeared and said, Ishmael's not the promised son. Sarah's going to have a baby who is 90, that Abraham falls to the ground laughing. Sarah, who's eavesdropping, falls to the ground laughing when God says you're going to have a baby. Ninety and a hundred. John Ortberg says in his book that they would have been the only couple shopping at Walmart for Huggies and Depends at the same time. They would be the only couple in the nursing home with a nursery. They can't believe it. They can't believe it. So they laugh. And wouldn't you know, here comes Isaac. And what do they name him? Laughter. Now, parents, you understand that you're going to call your child's name hundreds of thousands of times in their lifetime. Could it be that Abraham and Sarah named their son Laughter to remind them to never laugh when God makes a promise? Even when it doesn't make sense, even when everything's telling you that it's not going to happen, when God makes a promise, it will be done. So don't laugh. Don't laugh. Abraham and Sarah have this kid, and they name him Laughter. They've waited and waited and waited. Abraham's tried to take matters into his hands. God always intervenes. God always shows up. But then we come to chapter 22, which I'll tell you, being the father of small boys now, another one on the way, is my least favorite chapter in the Bible. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. I want you to turn there in your text. Sometime later... God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Now, this is not hide and seek. Abraham's not lost and God doesn't know where he's at. You've heard that old adage. It's not about ability. It's about availability. God, here I am, Abraham says. And God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Can you imagine? How many of you have seen the movie Princess Bride? Anybody seen the movie Princess Bride? That's okay, not a lot of you. Humor is not for everybody. But. but if you remember in that movie, there's this young girl, Buttercup. And it starts with her story. And she grows up on a farm. And one day she meets a boy, and that boy is just called Farm Boy. And whatever she asks, he always responds the same way. What is it, Donnie? As you wish. Doesn't matter how big the task is, doesn't matter how small the task is, he always responds as you wish. Well, as Buttercup grows up, she realizes that she's actually falling in love with Farm Boy. So one day she puts him to the test. She asks him to bring her a pitcher of water, and the pitcher of water is within her reach. She could get it herself. Farm Boy's out somewhere else. But she asks Farm Boy to bring her the pitcher of water that she could get. And farm boy rises to the occasion. He's our boy, right? What does he say? As you wish. And then the narrator comes on the scene and says, Suddenly, suddenly, Buttercup realized that every time farm boy had said, As you wish, what he was really saying is, I love you. Abraham and Isaac begin their journey up this mountain called Moriah. Rock and dirt and brush underfoot. And with each step, Abraham is realizing more and more and more that this voice who has been guiding him, this God that has provided for him, this God that has protected him, 
really loves him. And with every step closer to the place of sacrifice, what Abraham is saying to God is, as you wish, I love you too. We focus in this story. I focus exclusively at times on why, why, is, why would God ask this? This seems crazy. Why would God ask for a human sacrifice when that's completely out of the character of God? But because we focus almost exclusively on asking and answering that question, we miss the power of the story, which is that Abraham was going to do it. Because testing, testing reveals who or what we really love. And faith Faith is trusting in the present what is only going to make sense in the future. And that's terribly difficult. Despite what it looks like today, despite how crazy this sounds, I trust you. Because it's one thing, church, to believe in God. And it's another thing altogether to believe God. With each step closer to the peak, Abraham is not only saying, God, I'm here. He's saying, God, as you wish, I love you. And Abraham knows that love and obedience go hand in hand. You can't love somebody and not obey them. And that's why it says, verse 4, chapter 22. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, can you imagine? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine? I feel like I need to say this. This really happened. These are real people. This isn't a fairy tale. Abraham and Isaac actually encountered this. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that Isaac is 12. Can you picture the tears welling up in Abraham's eyes? He's got to be thinking about the time that he first met his son. His son's first steps. His first words. He waited a hundred years for his son. And now it's come down to this. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. I bet that was a quick reply. (laughs) Here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Isaac's heart wasn't pierced, but the Lord's heart was. What do you do with this story? This is a big story, right? This is one of those seminal stories in the Old Testament. What do you do with a story like this? Abraham, throughout his whole life, struggled and became a precursor for Israel, the nation, to struggle with God's promises. These big, grand, almost unbelievable promises and the reason he struggled and the reason that israel as a nation struggled with the promises that god made him and them is because they lived in today and what they saw today 
made the promises of God seem unbelievable. Do you understand what I'm saying? Faith is trusting in the present what will only make sense in the future. If it makes sense, it doesn't require a whole lot of faith, does it? You may be thinking yourself, scratching your head from time to time, thinking the promises that God makes are too good. They're too good to be true. They're larger than life. God says, I will never abandon you or forsake you. But you look at the circumstances that you're living in today and you feel forsaken. And so it would be awfully easy to take matters into your own hands. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. But you're thinking, Look at all of the circumstances that I have going on. Look at what's happening in my job. Look at what's happening in my marriage. Look at what's happening with my kids. And I have everything but rest. That promise can't be for me. We scratch our heads from time to time thinking, God, I don't know who you're talking to, but do you see my life today? You're not talking to me. Faith. Faith is trusting in the present. What only makes sense in the future. John Kavanaugh, a well-known scholar, tells the story about visiting Calcutta and visiting Mother Teresa. He went to Mother Teresa and he served with her for one day by her side. One day he approached her that day and he said, Mother Teresa, will you pray for me? She said, sure, absolutely. What do you want me to pray about? He said, pray that I trust God more, that I have clarity in my life. And she said, that first word makes sense. That second phrase, not so much. She said, I've never had clarity in my life. What I will pray is that when you don't have clarity, you will trust God more. Brothers and sisters, some of you right now, today, are going through a season of testing. God doesn't tempt Remember the Lord's Prayer that we talked about when we did the Sermon on the Mount several weeks ago? God doesn't tempt. He doesn't cause the things in life. But He is terribly interested to see how you respond when those things happen. He doesn't cause the pain. But He wants to see in the midst of that pain if you will trust Him or not. The doctor says it's cancer. Your spouse looks at you and says it's over there's no hope your boss sits you down and says we got to cut back the money's not there it's the end of the road what do you say how do you respond probably what you say is the same thing i would say which is the same thing abraham said why me have you ever said that why why me? Why can't we have a baby? Why was I born into this family? Why did my parents have to divorce? Why do I face addiction constantly? Why can't I get it together emotionally? Why can't I get ahead financially? Why, why, why? And we ask those questions, and I want you to know that when you ask those questions, you are in good company. Can you imagine what is going through Abraham's head when God comes to Abram, the same God that says, I'm going to provide for you. The world's going to be blessed because of your son, but I want you to sacrifice him. The night before he climbs Moriah, not being able to sleep. You've been there? Sleepless nights, wondering why it's working out the way that it is. Even if God doesn't engineer the moment, he can commandeer it. Our tendency, and it's totally human and totally normal, is to want to have it all figured out, right? We want everything figured out. And we want to know why everything's working, all straightened out, all mapped out. We like to convince ourselves that we are the ones in control until something in life spins out of control. Someone once wise said the only difference between you and God is that God doesn't think he's you. We like to say in our hearts, I got it. I can take care of it. I can do it. I can make it better. I can be the hero in my own story. I can write and star and direct and produce 
only to end up a few steps down the road realizing that we can't even rescue ourselves. We make for horrible heroes, you and me. But one author said about this story, God is seldom early, but he is never late. So if you are being tested right now, do not mistake the silence of God for the absence of God. Do not think he is absent. Do not think that he does not care. God is the one who provides. And that's why he's the hero in this story. Not Abraham. Remember, friends, it was God who was with Joseph when his brothers beat him up, threw him into a well, and sold him into slavery. It was God who was with Moses and the people of Israel when they gathered at the Red Sea and they marched across where water was and dry land appeared. It was God who was with Joshua and Caleb as they saw the mightiest, fiercest army approaching in Canaan. It was God who was with David when he fought Goliath. It was God who was with Daniel when he faced the lion. Den. It was God who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown into flames. It was God who has been with you as you look back over the history of your life and the struggles that you faced. Trust Him. His promises are grand. Admittedly, they are grand. But He says, He says to you, trust me. I can be the hero of your story. And because we trust, the hard stuff works out for our good and his glory in the end. The story of Abraham and the story of Israel is very much shaded in by the grand promises of God. And when they trusted in those promises, and you're going to see over the next several months, when Israel trusts God, they are always victorious. And when they don't, they always fail. When they doubted, they were led to sin. They were led to a break in relationship. Will you trust? And I can say, because of what happens on that same mountain, 2,000 years later, the mountain called Moriah is the same place, and Jewish tradition says the same spot where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac is where Jesus was crucified. 2,000 years after Abraham was led off by God. When God said, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. 2,000 years later, God sacrificed his own son in the same place for you and for me. Trust him. Let's pray together. Father God, we're grateful for every opportunity that you give us. Father, I pray that you would bless our church family here. There are situations that we face individually that are so terribly difficult. Help us see the promises that you've made to us. And help us trust you above all things, despite what we see today. That's the path to victory, because that's the path that you are leading us down. Help us. We need your help. Admittedly, Father, this is hard and we need you. Help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we offer you the opportunity to respond in some way. Maybe you're here and you need to experience the promises of God for the very first time. You've never become a follower. You've never become a disciple. This morning is a perfect opportunity to do that based on your penitent faith, your confession. You can be immersed today. You can experience that first great promise of faith. Maybe you have done that and your circumstances are just overwhelming and you need help. You need help, and we freely offer you what we can provide, which is encouragement and love and prayer, and we can point you in the right direction so that God can provide for you what only he can provide, which is most things. But we'll do for you what we can do and love on you. If we can be of assistance to you, let us know what we can do to help you while together we stand and while we sing.